Well, welcome everyone to this Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law uh, event. We're very pleased that you could be here. And we're especially pleased to be talking about such an important topic with someone who really has uh, quite a bit that is very interesting to say about it. In the last few years, we've heard the term energy security thrown around quite a bit uh, with turmoil in the Middle East, with uh, issues over global warming and alternative energy sources, with the increased demand on worldwide energy supplies uh, that is coming with China and India, its industrialization, uh, and with the whole issue of where the major supplies of energy and oil exist in the world, the whole question of energy security has become quite a heated one, quite a controversial one, uh, but one in which uh, I think it's fair to say there's not always been the greatest amount of calm reflection uh, and insight. And we're very fortunate today to have someone who's uh, very interesting background uh, should provide us with uh, a, a unique and interesting perspective on this. Felix, I've had the pleasure of knowing Felix Chang for uh, five, six years now. We first met on the kind of junket circuit as uh, the American Council of Germany Young Leaders Program. And we met again uh, this summer in Taiwan on a similar uh, excursion. And Felix not only represents in the type of subjects that he looks at, uh, the kind of innovative knowledge and breadth that we're looking for at the Strauss Center, but his background does as well. In the past, when we've looked at questions like this, the usual response is to round up uh, academics and scholars and think tanks. Uh, but Felix is unique in that he has a background in all sorts of worlds. He's got a, a very uh, distinguished academic background, an MBA from Duke, uh, a, a undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a student while I was getting my PhD and we, we were trying to figure out if we had crossed paths at that point or not. Uh, he has had uh, a very distinguished career in government and has worked uh, in a variety of agencies including in uh, 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 intelligence and in the defense department. Uh, he's worked in think tanks and is currently an associate at the uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia, a very distinguished uh, think tank. But he's also had great private sector experience working with uh, 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 Mobile Oil and most recently with uh, Booz Allen. And one of the things that the Strauss Center is really attempting to do is to find those rare individuals who actually are able to operate in all those worlds and bring the pers perspectives not just of the ivory tower but also the public sector and the private sector uh, into the discussion in a way that we think uh, uh, will improve the level of discussion and our level of understanding. So I am quite pleased and very happy to welcome Felix Chang to the Strauss Center uh, to speak. And the title of his talk will be Energy Security, Perceptions and Policy Choices. So please join me in welcoming Felix to Austin and the University of Texas. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, whenever I listen to uh, kind of the laundry list of what I've, well, all the places I've been, I always think that I uh, just never figured out what I wanted to do with my life, really. That's what it was. But um, as Frank uh, and I discussed uh, this, the concept for this talk back in, uh, was it uh, last fall, I guess, um, it, was, uh, it, it was a struggle to try to encapsulate a lot of thoughts. And um, when I actually mentioned this at the time, I was consulting at the uh, Department of Energy. And uh, I mentioned it to uh, one of the staffers there. She, uh, she immediately said, uh, you're going to go talk about energy security in, in Texas? Um, what do they know about uh, conservation or renewable energy? And I had to remind her that Texas does have the largest wind farm in the United States now. But um, it, it, the little vignette does, does um, highlight a, uh, there we go, the kind of dichotomy, the kind of broad perspectives on energy security that exists out there today. And if you ask a global audience um, how to address that issue, uh, the number of responses is just absolutely bewildering. And it, it, it 
covers you know covers the galaxy of you know large policy issues, small local issues, and so the question of course here is uh, so well how does how do policymakers make sense of all of it? How do you organize all these uh, concepts in a, co in a coherent way that makes public policy di discussion about energy security uh, possible? So um, let us look back. Actually, uh, as Frank mentioned, I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, where I actually I focus on history. So let's look back, as any good historian would, at the uh, first great energy crisis. Now, this is obviously a setup, but can anybody uh, think of what was the first great energy crisis in the United States? When was that? All right, no, no takers. But most people would say the 1970s, of course, with the, uh, the oil embargoes uh, from OPEC. But um, actually, I would argue that the first great energy crisis was in the 1870s. Um, when the United States faced what a, a great public policy topic of a timber famine, at the time the United States, um, the United States and its economy basically ran off of wood. Um, horses drew wooden carriages over wooden plank roads, and uh, steam engines were fueled by wood, by and large. And as the public policy debate matured, uh, by the turn of the century the uh, U.S. Forest Service was created. And the head of that service um, kind of defined the public response to that famine, which is what he wrote here, where conflicting interests must be reconciled. The question will always be decided from the standpoint of the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run. And that has really been the kind of guiding light for the U.S. Forest Service ever since then. But in, in thinking about it from a public policy perspective, um, and in, in looking at it actually from another discipline, mathematics, it, it does, if you, if you think about that statement, it does kind of sound like an optimization problem. Um, basically, to find a solution in the feasible region which has a maximum or minimum value of an objective function. In other words, the best of all possible solutions. Now, uh, for those of you who haven't taken uh, linear programming, <laughs> optimization assumes this objective function, kind of a, a common understanding of the possible solutions or a common worldview. Now, getting back to energy security, is there one for energy security? Well, lots of folks think so. And so they start throwing darts at it, or in this case, I guess, arrows, um, to try to get to that greatest good, um, to try to get to what they think it is. And of course, in the process, criticizing a lot of other people who they think are misguided in their beliefs, of course. Um, so, uh, so in thinking about that, it's good to think about What makes the world go round? Basically, energy. Um, I have to show this kind of obligatory eye chart slide here about uh, uh, the energy flows of the United States. This is from 2006. Um, there are many things you can take from this from this chart. Uh, the uh, let's see, the kind of uniqueness of solar photovoltaic. Uh, en energy production because it's probably the only one that there that produces electricity by the need of a turbine. Um, there is the kind of interesting aspect of the fact that uh, almost all forms of electricity require a turbine and a thermal plant. Um, but what I really want to focus on here is, uh, is two things. One is the bifurcation of how energy is consumed. Basically, Transportation fuels and electricity are the usage patterns. The, the actual resources that go into it, as you can see from this entire list, the transportation fuels, petroleum and biofuels, are the only two. And I, I tried, when I created this chart, I tried to uh, kind of weight the, uh, the arrows to accurately represent what the, um, 
what the inputs are from the energy resources themselves. But that's the first thing. And the, uh, the second thing is, of the resources uh, required to, you know, to, uh, to create those, those usage flows, if you, if you take a look at the variety um, of methodologies from the electric, electric, electrical perspective, um, that will become important a little bit later on. So let's get to definitions. So what is energy security? 2001, the International Energy Agency defined it as the availability of a regular supply of energy at an affordable price. In 2007, the White House had a summit with the European Union and issued a statement basically to the fact that um, energy security seeks to ensure access to affordable, clean, which was the new kind of term that was added there, and secure sources of energy to underpin sustainable global economic growth and to protect our environment. So to summarize, I created this little definition, the, which I define as the availability of a reliable, affordable, and clean energy supply. Sounds simple enough, right? I think we all can agree with that. So if that's the case, then getting from here to there, you have to apologize for my, uh, my drawing. I, I just kind of did it on the fly. But uh, this is, these are the, this is the public, the policymakers, and they want to get to that, that future, that energy security future. And it should be a simple matter of getting from point one to two to three, and you kind of get there. But not so. Um, what I found in discussing uh, this topic with a lot of people, uh, from a lot of different places around the world and a lot of different occupations is that there are really three completely separate world views. Um, one revolves around power and that gets to the, uh, the, the, the issue of reliability. One revolves around kind of the economics which gets to the issue of affordability and uh, of course the environment and the issue of the cleanliness of that supply of energy. And um, the best way I can, uh, the best way I can, uh, I guess, talk about this issue is back in uh, in the late '90s when I was still at Mobile Oil. Uh, I was pretty new at that point at, at, the, at the company, and uh, an invitation came to go speak at an energy and environmental conference in Europe, and. Uh, Looking down at the list of attendees, they noticed a lot of environmental organizations would be there, and they thought, okay, who should we send over there? Well, well, let's send Felix. He's the new guy. We'll throw him to the wolves. So I went off, kind of girded for, uh, for battle, as it were. And, but when I arrived there, I, I found in, in talking to the... Uh, talking to the people from government organizations, non-government organizations, and private industry, that um, the real issue was that they weren't really seeing the same future. They were seeing different visions of what energy security meant, and oftentimes they would basically be talking past each other. So whereas some folks got really uh, uh, aggravated over the course of the, uh, of the, of the conference, um, I saw it less in, in terms of aggravation as in terms of, well, just misinterpretation. Um, not to say that, they're, they're, that they are reconcilable. In fact, the reason why I laid it out this way is because they are very separate issues. And to get to each vision of the future, there are, there's a different public policy kind of policy chain that you might want to follow. And um, so that is a complication. Uh, but seemingly, you know, you could, you could kind of work through that and create that op optimal situation. But, um, but as you think about the, uh, these worldviews and how you move down the paths, they conflict. So if you want to go from point one to point two, 
it may actually trigger a negative outcome for point B over here. And in moving to uh, point three, you could trigger a negative in over there at point Z, which has an unintended consequence of making point Y negative and, of course, making point C negative. And rapidly, this becomes very difficult. Um, and this is where a lot of the policy debate centers. Because, for instance, in the field of uh, say natural gas pipeline, say the, uh, the, Euro the, I don't know how many of you know, there's, there's, there's great consternation in Western Europe over a pipeline that runs from Russia through to, the, to Western Europe. And um, it, would, it would go great, it would take great strides in solving this issue and creating an affordable source of energy. But relying on Russia for, well, for anything, is a little haphazard from the perspective of the, of the power relationship. Um, moving from point two to point three, say that that would be the building more nuclear power plants. Well, that has negative effects for potentially for the environment, direct in terms of, um, well, in terms of the potential f dangers, hazards, even as small as they may be, of a, uh, of a n nuclear plant having a, a meltdown. Um, but then there's the unintended consequence also of producing nuclear waste. What do you do with nuclear waste? And of course, that nuclear waste could be you know, reprocessed if, if uh, let loose in the world and to create nuclear weapons, which would affect this, that chain as well. So, as you can see, the, uh, it, is very, it, it is very difficult to reconcile all three worldviews. But in order to try to kind of understand where they're coming from, there we go, I tried to dissect each of the worldviews and what underlies each of them. And for each of them, there's an underlying concern, a valid under underlying concern. Um, for, for the power, fo folks who are interested in the power aspect of it, it's really to gain greater s security. Economics perspective, how to improve economic conditions, um, either world globally or nationally. And for, of course, for the environment, it's to how to maintain a healthy environment. Other divergences I found were that the attitude on how to approach these issues toward energy resources and toward actually national sovereignty were very different. In terms of, uh, in terms of power, move back a little bit. Um, it's really uh, much more highly controlled on this end and much more shared on the other end. So, for instance, on the issue of sovereignty, um, most folks who hold the view of uh, kind of that environmental future um, really don't place a very high uh, standing on national sovereignty. They, they see the issues as uh, global and therefore the, the restrictions of artificial national boundaries not as relevant um, as the folks over here who are very concerned about um, national power, um, national kind of freedom of action. Um, and, and that flows into how they, how they see the role of energy in these realms. Folks who look at the power dimension um, tend to see it as a way to compel or deter others. Whereas folks in the economics field uh, really see it as a way to create wealth and employment. And Contrary to even those who, uh, who I used to work with at Mobile Oil, uh, folks in the, env in the environmental kind of dimension, they, they don't see it as something to be uh, circumscribed. They do see energy as a way to promote human, well human well-being. Now, what are the primary issues? To the folks in the power dimension, it's basically how to control parts of the energy value chain. And that's writ large. So it not only encompasses uh, uh, things like um, you know, pipelines, 
but also, as we were discussing coming over here, uh, choke points where, where uh, energy resources might flow through, say, the Strait of Hormuz. From the economics perspective, the primary issue of energy security is how to stabilize prices. Um, and you often hear that discussed in uh, American political discourse, of course, with gasoline prices. Uh, and of course, for the environmental folks, it's really how to address climate change and what do you have to do to do that. And the solutions that they offer, and I'll get into more of the uh, policy prescriptions later uh, in greater detail, but as an overarching concept, uh, the folks who focus on power really focus on creating energy dependence or independence as a way of addressing the issue of controlling the, uh, the parts of the energy value chain. For the economics folks, the, uh, it's really to increase and diversify energy production towards market efficient resources. And for the environment, environment folks, it's really to increase conservation and energy intensity. Those are the, those are the areas, solutions that they really focus on. Um, and of course, diversifying what additional energy production is required uh, toward renewable sources. Now, for uh, more specific um, pres policy prescriptions, uh, unsurprisingly, they, they also diverge. The, um, and they diverge on two different dimensions. Uh, as, we, as I showed in the uh, kind of obligatory slide on the uh, flow of energy in the United States, they're really two categories, and they're really very separate. Transportation fuels and electricity. Um, Transportation fuels uh, are it's kind of separated from electricity, not so much because of what it's used for, but because of the their flex the the flexibility of their infrastructure. Um, transportation fuels it's very difficult to switch inputs because the supporting infrastructure. Um, wow, I, I must have did a copy and paste. That should be inflexible, not flexible. Um, the the oil industry and the auto industry have a uh, have a very tight relationship that has benefited both of them. Um, there is an infrastructure that supports an oil-based transportation network, i.e., all the gas stations that you see across the United States and across the world. It is very difficult to remove yourself from that infrastructure because you have to create a new infrastructure to support. Yeah, everything you know, an electric car system, and uh, and one of the big heated debates right now in in Washington, uh, well among uh, policymakers as well as in corporate boardrooms, is uh, each of these two industries pointing their fingers at each other and saying who is going to move first? Um, does the car industry move first uh, in developing, um, say, electric vehicles? Uh, they say well. We can't because if we sell them, no one will be able to replenish you know, their, their uh, electric batteries on the road. Whereas the oil industry uh, says, well, um, what we can't, we can't uh, divorce ourselves from the, uh, the natural resource industry uh, because there are not enough cars in order to create the gas station the gas stations, so I guess it wouldn't be gas stations, the fueling stations, to equip them with the electrical, out, electrical power in order to do that, electrical systems in order to do that. Um, electricity is, is very different though. The, um, it's, very, it's relatively easy to switch inputs because as we saw earlier, almost all the electricity goes through this process of thermal plants and then um, and turbines in order to create the electricity. So, relatively speaking, the supporting infrastructure for electricity, the switching costs, are, are much lower. And so, um, and so as we look across the, uh, the, the field here, the folks who are interested in power um, really want to increase control over production and distribution. So, either through economic means or military means, um, to control those either the sources, i.e. the oil fields themselves, 
or the uh, or the oil pipelines in the case of transportation fuels, for instance. Um, and they are very willing to impose price controls if necessary in order to achieve their ends. Because from their perspective, the most important thing is the security of, uh, well, their relative security relative to other, other countries around the world. Um, from the economic point of view, it's, it's, very, it's a little different, as I, sh as I described in that kind of shaded bar there. Um, they're not so much interested in who owns what or who controls what, but that they have access to it and that they have access to it at affordable prices. And so their policy prescriptions to many of the, uh, many of the um, problems of the day are to uh, basically focus on what is uh, market efficient. So for instance, in electricity, um, increase the use of natural gas and nuclear energy. Um, they are not adverse to uh, renewable energy sources, but they would rather have it spurred by incentives. And, um, and even in the uh, kind of the carbon debate that is, it has e erupted in, uh, in, in Washington between the carbon tax folks and the carbon cap and trade folks, the, um, I would actually argue that the carbon tax folks would fall into the economics uh, realm because what it does is it, it, creates, um, it creates incentives through, through stabilizing um, future expectations of what revenue and cost streams will be. And, in, and basically in doing so, it enables folks, business folks, to take, uh, to take longer term views and to make the investments that uh, are necessary in power plants that, are, that will last for 20 or 30 years. And I can get into that in, in, the, uh, in the discussion period afterwards. Um, this was something that I started thinking about in, in, in my travels to, uh, to East Asia, to Europe, uh, in, in talking to various different audiences about energy security and how they perceive it. Um, the, the kind of width, or I guess height, I'm sorry, the height of each of these bars is the, uh, is the GDP um, in PPP terms in uh, 2007. Um, I just threw that in there just to give you a, a relative uh, understanding of the impact that each one might have. Um, but in terms of where they lie on this, on this spectrum, <coughs> Russia clearly, and, and when, I, when, I, when I created the bar, I also had to realize that you know, there, there are folks in, in the United States who lie very far to the, the left and very far to the right as well. What I tried to do is capture kind of the, where the general populace and where uh, policymakers tend to tend to dwell um, in Russia, very far to the left on the power on the power side, um, and in the European Union, as you might expect, uh, much further to the right over there. And the United States tends to be tends to be in the middle of it all in, in this particular spectrum, the way I've laid it out. But there is overlap, and there there. And you can, what I want to get across with this is that there are areas of commonality and that there are areas where cooperation is, are possible, is possible. All right. All right. The other thing that I've learned in all my travels is that uh, the policy debate is not going to end <laughs> as long as there are these divergent worldviews. Um, by and large, it's focused on the negative impacts on the other side's policy choices, rather than on what motivates, what incents um, each of each of the players in this in this uh, in this debate. Uh, now that said, I'd, I'd like to caveat that with uh, with this little this nifty little chart here. Um, many, many of you might remember this from high school chemistry. It's the, uh, it's the catalyst chart. In order to create a reaction, um, you add a catalyst and it actually lowers the energy required to get from point A to point B. Um, in, in, in my little uh, uh, characterization of it, it's really that the, switch, the ability to um, make trade-offs 
between the worldviews is much more is much easier if uh, if new technology is introduced, which lowers the uh, the costs on on both sides. But the pace of innovation is difficult to predict. Um, the the ideas that came out of um, well, American technology and American innovation in the 1970s as a response to the oil shocks there haven't really come to, did not really come to full fruition really until the 2000s. Um, much of the technology that was uh, invested at that time was not cost effective, where it is, whereas today it's becoming much more so. So how do we move forward? How do we move forward from here? Um, way forward, Number one, each side appreciates the other side. This is the kind of reconciliation uh, model. Uh, each side appreciates the other side's worldviews and works to integrate their constraints and incentives in developing a joint worldview that basically everybody can, may not be all, you know, smiles and kisses over, but they can all agree to and that policymakers can then optimize. Way forward number two is a little bit more opportunistic. It's um, focusing that it's focusing efforts basically on how each side works within its own worldview, and then policymakers essentially pick from among the successful solutions. So these folks might work on one aspect, these folks on another, and then uh, they say we want this one, this one, and that. And that's, that has been a, a second way of approaching this issue. Both these ways are being sought in, uh, within government circles as well as industry circles. Um, I can't tell you which way is going to win out. Um, we can discuss that a little bit later. I have my own personal views, I guess. Um, but we started this discussion with a talk uh, a little bit of discussion, I guess, about the timber famine. Um, fortunately for the United States, its energy usage at the time, which was based on steam, uh, was flexible. And timber soon gave way uh, to coal and then, and then oil as fuels. Um, so the crisis was averted. But at the time, if you think about it from a public policy uh, discussion, there was basically one world view, and that was that of economics. The public policy response was to create the U.S. Forest Service um, to manage the use of the national commons. The, uh, the voice of preservation, uh, despite the hoopla that Teddy Roosevelt often gets, was still very, very small. Now, since then, I, I, that small voice has grown much louder. And that really became the environmental movement of the late 60s and early 70s and really focused on how to protect our national forests. Uh, but the policy debate that accompanied all that change uh, was neither clear-cut nor definitive. It goes on today. And um, today's energy security problem, unfortunately, does not benefit from that, that same circumscribed national parameters uh, as the timber famine had. Instead, it spans the globe. It stretches beyond the boundaries of overt governance. Um, but one thing it does have in common with the timber famine of the 1870s is that uh, we must recognize that what is considered to be the greatest good changes over time, and it changes with human needs. In closing, however we approach it, energy security remains an important public policy issue for national security, economic development, and the habitability of the environment. It is important now because the choices we make today will endure for the next 20, 30 years because that is the length of time that the investments we make today will have uh, into the future. Thank you very much. Frank? Well, uh, I suggest that the way we do this is that the next question is uh, raise your hand so us can call on you. Identify yourself and we'll know uh, where you're from and uh, we'll do that or uh, I want to thank you. That was a very comprehensive, uh, fascinating uh, kind of a 
global view of uh, the different interests involved in this whole energy security debate. Uh, now, when I first see the kind of the trade-offs you set off, the first thing I think about, and I suspect knowing you, you might think the same thing, that, well, you know, we actually have a solution to these issues. It's a pricing mechanism, right? I mean, prices should reflect all of the issues that you're talking about, right? Um, now, and that, you know, in, in many other sort of uh, fields or industries or particular goods, all these questions are taken care of. If something's scarce, something's a problem, it goes up in cost. Uh, and there are two arguments against that. I guess I would want your comment on that because it would seem to be a pricing mechanism that would have to be part of any solution. The first is that uh, in energy, uh, the pricing of energy doesn't take into account externalities very well. Right? And there's two big externalities it doesn't take care of. The first is security, we talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, although one can certainly argue that, uh, I'm sure you can comment on, but on the price of a barrel of oil, there's certainly a certain high percentage of risk factor that's factored into the price of oil. But there's a lot of people say security externality really isn't effectively taken care of. So that and the other externality is, of course, environmental damage. Mm -hmm. um, so comment on that. Yeah, I'd like to hear, do you think the pricing mechanism, maybe with some tinkering, could be uh, an effective way of coming up with this problem? The, the, the second argument against the pricing mechanism being effective is that there are certain types of goods that aren't the same as others. They're strategic goods. Right? And that, that there's something about their quality, something about their characteristics that means we can't just allow them to be determined by market mechanisms. And that uh, maybe it's because there's a national security angle to it. Maybe because our dependence upon it, uh, you know, the prices would become too unstable, would have too large an effect. This is an argument that you commonly uh, hear. So if you could. Um, comment on whether or not you think a price, just a pricing mechanism can take care of resolve these differences, if not why, if so, how it can be improved. Um, and kind of related to that is uh, we had Rex Dillerson here about three or four months ago talking, giving a speech, discussing it. Yeah, he, he, one phrase that's often associated with energy security is energy independence. He made it quite clear this is a ridiculous way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, the notion of energy independence, which is very um, politically popular, uh, doesn't make any sense. In fact, no matter how you tinker with the pricing model, that fossil fuels are going to be the core of energy use for quite some time. There's just really no way around it. And Exxon Mobil, as you know better than anybody, has made a bet on this. Other energy companies have bet in a different direction. But Exxon Mobil, and one gets a sense, you know, the bad experience in the 70s with some experimentation, came back and fight them. And they're just, you can do whatever you want, oil and gas are still going to be important. And it seems, you know, even people environmentally, some interesting things to this way too, that McKinsey report, which talked about essentially, if you read between the lines, that you know, not only is the only replacement for oil and gas is the coal, which is even worse for the environment, the only thing you can do to help the environment is conserve. So all this stuff about alternative energy is really just kind of a lot of hopeful but not realistic thoughts. So I was wondering if you could comment on those. Okay. Um, well, the first two I'll take together, actually. Uh, whether a pricing mechanism uh, will uh, substantially alleviate the, uh, the, uh, the problems that we face with energy security and the, was it the whether or not strategic resources are kind of beyond the, uh, beyond the scope sometimes of, uh, I mean, it may not just be energy resources, it could be you know, precious types of metals that are very rare and, and, uh, and are uh, highly sought after. Um, the way you phrased the, uh, even framed the, I guess, not phrased, framed the, the first question puts you right here. Because the, the way, the, the way, because you're an American, I'm an American. I think we're mostly, most of us here are Americans. Um, and the way Americans think about it is in those terms. And it's very natural for us to think about it in those terms. Um, but when I go, and uh, I mean, you've been, we, 
well, some of us have been to Russia. And uh, when you talk to a, a Russian about this, they come at it from a very different perspective. They come at it from the second perspective. It's something to be, it's a national treasure. It's something that we have and we should use to, for our, um, you know, to further our national goals. It, it's not thought of as, a, as simply a, uh, a pricing or an economic issue. Um, even if it's to you know, reduce the, the use or encourage its use or whatever. Um, if, if, and China is another great example of that. They have price controls over uh, transportation fuels for the last two and a half, three years now. Um, which ba ba basically, I mean, their primary objective is, is kind, of, whoops, kind of in between here, which is national economic development. And that's what they are mainly concerned about. And so their perspective on it is, well, um, since national economic growth is our, is our principal priority, um, I will try to subsidize the, the use of energy in China through these price subsidies. But what it really does is it just expands the use of energy resources because the pricing mechanism, as you mentioned, is not working there. Um, so to, the, to, to answer your first question, whether a pricing mechanism is the way to go, uh, I think for the United States, it is the way to go because it is in our, it's in our world view, it's in the, how we conceive of uh, energy that it's, it's, it's most logical to do. Um, and to the question of energy independence and whether that's, was it, whether that's possible or not? No, just sort of uh, comment on, there are a lot of people who want to see reduce uh, dependence on fossil fuels, particularly from some of these uh, suppliers that are less reliable, it might be general competitors, and there's many people in the industry who feel that, that's, that, that having that discussion is somewhat foolish because uh, there's just, there's, that it's not realistic to think about alternatives to it. Um. That would significantly affect the total energy supply. Well, to create the world that we live in today, which the energy flow chart here is demonstrates, it took, what, 100 years? Um, any change is going to take time. Um, whether or not that we could completely get away from this, I, I would have to agree. It w we will never get there. Um, but the, the potential for the, electric, the uh, electric, electricity producing sector um, to harness these resources and reduce their dependence on these, I think is possible. Um, simply because they're, I mean, every time you have high oil, pr high fuel prices, um, whether it's uh, you know natural gas, coal, or whatever, uh, to produce energy, it triggers the. Uh, well, I don't want to go to another slide, but that that technology gap. That, uh, that folks start investing in that. And uh, Frank didn't mention this earlier, but uh, I tend to have to believe that because um, my current position is actually in venture capital. And uh, we do believe that there are technologies out there and there are methodologies out there that will either, one, reduce the amount of electricity produced, um, or not produced, uh, consumed, or that produces it in different ways. Now. For, for transportation fuels, I would have to completely agree with my, uh, my former coworkers, I guess. It's, it's just very difficult to completely, I mean, there are only two avenues here, petroleum and biofuels. And biofuels for the United States means ethanol at this point, um, which carries with it a lot of other externalities. But, um, but as you can see, biofuels, in fact, I couldn't even draw the line thin enough. Yeah, but uh, I mean, basically, almost all of it comes from petroleum, and to change the American economy and to restructure it in a way that uh, divorces ourselves from that dependency, it's extremely difficult, difficult, and extremely improbable in uh, in the near term. I guess it would really have to require a, a, a major concerted effort on part of not just the petroleum industry, but auto and petroleum industries together at the same time. Yeah, so uh, they talk about very uh, literally interested in sustainable mobility. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a lot. 
lot more optimistic, actually, of some of the technologies that you mentioned, the electrification of the automobile over time to augment petroleum. And we don't have to get rid of petroleum. It's a great, safe, mm -hmm. safe, relatively clean, headlight converters, not much right. engine management systems. As a matter of fact, some cars actually clean the air in dirty cities. And we don't have to replace that. Even getting the, the supposed ridiculous position of energy independence would mean we still have 40% of the transportation fuels that we produce ourselves. But what I see when I talk to executives of General Motors, who are really pioneering and investing hundreds of millions of dollars in plug-in hybrids, what they call extended range electric vehicles, they're pioneering. And so I, what I see are a number of technological breakthroughs, the first of which was driven by the computer industry as far as electronics that made all electronic controls viable mm -hmm. for electric vehicle, electrified vehicle. And the second wave now, consumer electronics is driven with lithium ion batteries. So I see within the next few years that we'll see some pioneering technology plug in hybrids that really do have a viable potential mass market appeal. Sort of like Bolt, for example, personally. Right. Secondly, I'm on that list, actually. I'm sorry? I'm on the list. You can sign up for uh, one of the first models of that. Yes. And so I, you know, I hear Bob Lutz talk enough about it, and I've talked to General Motors engineers mm -hmm. and executives, and they have hundreds of engineers on it. They're actually pioneering a lot of that, and I think it has a, a viable plan, a viable chance of meaningful impact. It will take many years to Right. Okay. Far better of an opportunity than fuel cell vehicles or the hydrogen division, especially when you look at the welding wheels analysis in terms of the environmental impact of the energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So I see that. So I see emerging of those two sectors that traditionally for 100 plus years have been separate. Secondly, there are research uh, papers from the national labs that talk about the synergy between, say, wind power and when the peak of wind power is and when you charge up these plug-in hybrids that actually have a synergistic effect for both. So in the biofuels, I see investments in Cascada and other companies, and I see Brazil's energy independence through sugar-based ethanol. Mm -hmm. Which, so is, which is a... That would be a thin line. I think that's a very meaningful example. So I see between biofuels and... I put biodiesel in your checks, too, not just to ethanol. And the electrification of the automobiles being something that has a very meaningful chance of impact in the next decade. I, I don't question that there will be a sizable impact. Um, I do question how how uh, how big of an impact that would have on the overall um, I don't know economy of the United States. Put it that way. Is that because you think we'll have another rebound? The last time in '86, the Saudis turned on the state and drove down energy prices to get the cartel. Well, right. do you think that if these technologies come online and they really have demand destruction or substitution, that it will lower prices enough to start hampering the alternatives again? Uh, or is it just the technology? Yeah, let me. Uh, actually, that is my one backup slide. The classic thing is the sinusoidal wave with progressively not with slope still. There's the issue of the, of the what you're actually talking about. I mean, in, in, the, in the 80s, was uh, the issue of uh, spare production capacity for oil in the world that yes, the yes, Saudis yes, could. Yes. And um, the reason that that uh, and this is kind of the, the spare capacity of the percentage of total production. You can see in the in the mid 80s, you had this massive spike. Um, and then, of course, it trails out to almost nothing. Uh, the, and this is overall global uh, oil production. I actually put this slide in there because I figured somebody would ask about peak oil. But, um, but it, it marries very well with, with, your, with your comments because um, the, uh, when we had the big energy crisis in the, in the early 70s, the, um, the oil industry responded by massive investment in, in uh, new production capacity. That didn't come online until here. And that's what really caused the, the, the decline. 
And back in 2000 and I uh, forget 2000. Uh, back in 1997, when I was at when I started at Mobile, um, oil prices were uh, a bit south of where they were right now. They were about 13, 14 dollars a barrel. And let me tell you, it was really hard going to the board of directors and trying to convince them of any project at 13, 14 dollars a barrel. And so, by 2001, when oil prices started to go up again. Um, there was a lot of reticence in the, in, in the boardroom of major oil corporations from making the same mistake. Because as, as those of you who grew up in Texas know, um, whereas the uh, rest of the United States was enjoying a pretty good sized boom by the mid to late 80s, Texas had a, a small mini recession. And um, cities like Dallas had to completely reinvent themselves into kind of technology and healthcare, healthcare care. Which being good Texans as they do, they do. <laughs> um, but early in this decade, when that boom happened, in oil, when the oil prices started creeping up, the uh, executives said, "You know what? We're not going to get duped again. We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, rush in just like we did here and cause this huge, you know, additional capacity and then a huge crash in oil prices." And uh, you know, time goes on, and they realize, you know, this this rise is actually sustained and it keeps and it's you know sustained to this day really. Now there's this huge investment in oil production. And technology is not only advancing for um, electric vehicles, uh, and I'm just talking about oil production here, not just all energy sources. But uh, technology is also advancing in the oil industry. And the more the higher the price of oil goes, the higher the amount of investment in technologies to extract it at a lower cost, go. and so um, so I'm not one of these folks who believes that oil prices, you know, will just continue to go up forever at this point, um, because there will be a point at which those technologies and that new capacity coming on stream will present a challenge. And to those of us who deal in you know either alternative energy sources or um, or conservation, it's going to have to face that reality in the future. So can you talk about what's different this time? Because it, during the 70s, that was a, mostly a geopolitical problem with the embargo. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure was a shortage. But a number of new technologies and factors came online. Horizontal drilling technology yep. has created deep, deep water, um, special recovery with injection. So, so there were a lot of technologies to help recover. I'm not hearing when I talk to professors of petroleum, that they, that they have a new bag of trick, oh, computerization, supercomputer seismologically. I, I just don't hear that there's a next bag of tricks that's going to make another radical step forward in that A. B, I think back then, um, we had less of a situation where the majors um, were excluded from yeah. wealth. And so we have a lot of these countries who've nationalized their their natural resources who don't really manage it that well, it's tapping into it mm -hmm. to support social and governmental expenditures, and they starve their capital investments, which further hamper, maybe destroy the, the long term. I.e., Venezuela and Libya. Yeah. And so, you know, then there was an article in today's Wall Street Journal about how oil companies are really buying, they're not investing as much proportionally, they're repurchasing stock and upper dividends more than reinvesting in their own businesses. Yep. So I think there's a, a few set of dynamics that are different. Um, I agree that dynamics, are d the industry is different. The industry has definitely changed. Um, the, uh, well, first let me, let me address the issue of innovation. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, innovation is uncertain. Um, before horizontal drilling took place, or was developed, you know, was it possible? Maybe. Um, there, uh, coming from, coming from, uh, I guess Exxon Mobil. Gosh, uh, I know that there are a lot of folks working on a lot of different technologies. Whether which one will prove fruitful, I don't know. Um, will it prove fruitful? I don't know. But in in terms of the uh, the industry changing because of the net because of as I described to you earlier, the kind of many countries viewing um, 
at least oil production, as uh, in the, in the, through the lens of power, um, and basically, as you as you alluded to, creating nas national, um, creating making it into this national resource that is managed by government organizations and not doled out to international oil companies. The industry is changing, and it, and you're cr absolutely correct. It is changing in those dimensions, but it's changed in other dimensions as well. The reason that they can actually do that right now is because of this period of time right here. Um, as you probably know, the, um, I mean, in the late 80s, uh, oil, big American and British and European oil companies weren't hiring, and they were shedding folks. And a lot of them went to, uh, well, independence. Um, a lot of those very skilled personnel went into independence, and they developed um, they developed the tertiary recovery techniques that is so popular today. And oil companies, by the time I got to uh, Mobile Oil, were um, outsourcing a lot of this work to them. Well, they can be outsourced to anybody. And one of the reasons why these national oil companies have become so strong is because they can have access to that technology even without the majors. And that's one of the reasons uh, why they've gained such great traction lately. I hope that answers you, that part of the question. So, uh, I'll be asked the question regarding peak oil. Do you believe the Dean Jurgen that is way out there and then will get augmented by, uh, by some other fuels, you know, whether it be tar sands or biofuels? Um, I think, well, it, again, it depends on usage, usage patterns. If, um, if we continue the usage patterns we, we are, are at currently, there very well, very well may be this kind of, uh, actually, I'm not even saying multiple peaks. It might be peaking and then coming up and peaking again someplace else. The, um, and that gets back to the, the earlier comment about the economics of it all. Um, there, if you, I mean, we all know. I mean, we drill right here, right now. We'll find oil. Just, it's just a matter of how much is it going to cost to actually recover it. And um, so I, I would have to tend. To, I would tend to agree. It's, it's, it's out there. It's just a matter of how much does it cost. And again, that's a very American perspective, but. How does this yeah. view? Uh, in yeah, I mean, in the United States, I, I, I view a lot of the technology is trying to reconcile these these two aspects, um, and make and basically ha not have that tend to occur um, as much. So uh, the the kind of unintended consequences of one path over another. Hopefully, will be uh, reduced, but through technology. Um, no more so than they were in the 1970s, I would say. I mean, we 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 live in today. We live. We don't live somewhere in the future, so uh, the the technology that is available. I don't know if you, if waiting is the right is the right term to, to 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 from a public policy perspective. Waiting is the right way of thinking about you know whether we should move forward or not. Um, I think we're going to move forward with whatever technology we have right now, and whatever technology that's kind of in the immediate offing. And if you have a good idea, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
Um, politicians often end up in the world of uh, should. They want to, um, they stand up and they have a platform and they say, we should do this. And in uh, energy policy, they tend to make the rapid statements that we should have energy independence or energy security or something like that. But um, if you take it one step beyond that empty statement to, um, I don't know, there ought to be a policy debate in America if you were serious about answering these kinds of questions in terms of should and how we would reconcile our different goals with different values. And particularly, I guess I want to ask the question, um, uh, why should we want cheap energy or should we want expensive energy? If you were a politician that wanted to seriously address the issues of energy security that you raised today in a descriptive way, uh, you know, what's the responsible course? Should we be raising or lowering the price of energy in the United States? Let's see here. There we go. Um, we live in a democracy. Politicians, in order to say should, need to get elected. Um, it's kind of hard to get elected <laughs> on the basis of uh, raising energy costs. Um, now, there are policy debates, I know, I mean, as we all know about the uh, of dealing with the carbon issue, which would essentially, I mean, raise the cost of energy um, as a, as a means, either through a carbon tax or, or the cap and trade method, um, as a means to uh, to refocus usage on the uh, the, the one that is most least harmful to the environment. Um, I'm not a politician. I can't. Uh, <laughs> well, it's so uh, we don't like it that when we buy oil, we take some of the money from oil and goes to people who don't like us. Right? So whether it's mm -hmm. Saudis taking the money and giving it to Al Qaeda, or whether it's Hugo Chavez sticking his finger in our eye at the UN, we don't like it. Mm -hmm. So we could suggest let's stop, you know, let's adopt policies to stop giving money to people we don't like. It will raise the cost of energy in the United States. You know, put high tariffs on imported oil, for example. Yeah. Right? There are all kinds of ways to make proposals and explain why maybe you would want to do, you know, you could, in any of these power economics environments, you could make a case for high or low oil prices, and I, I think you're exactly right. People, their natural response is we like low oil prices, nobody likes to pay a lot of money when they fill up their gas tank, but if you ask them lots of different questions or explain to them lots of different issues, how they relate, you get lots of different answers, and this is the problem with the cacophony of our oil our, our energy policy today is that we have conflicting goals. I don't know how to sort it out. You think a lot about this field, so how do you sort it out? I, uh, I guess my, uh, my background in, I guess, the practical realities of business, um, Lead me to believe that uh, the path of least resistance is the way that folks will eventually travel. And um, interest rates. The United States has pretty low interest rates relative to the rest of the world. And having, and the reason it, it has kind of unusually low interest rates given our. Uh, government's fiscal and, and monetary policies is because the, well, the reserve currency of the world is the U.S. dollar. And it allows us to spend in, in ways that a, this kid from upstate New York would n rather not see their government spend. But it does. And, uh, but other, other players in this, in this you know, global monetary system um, all have an interest in preserving it. East Asian countries have an interest in preserving the way things work um, because it enables them to pursue 
uh, export-led economic development, um, and they, it enables them to accumulate large surpluses of U.S. dollars. Many different players have an interest in, in, in the system. And so when you, when you pose a question of, well, you know, can't we just, as a public policy issue, you know, start thinking about higher, higher prices for all this, um, I think it'll be as feasible as, well, let's just raise interest rates across the board in order to, in order to you know, stop this, you know, the U.S. dollar from falling abroad, the, the whole system of, of, of governance of how, uh, how countries govern monetary policy. I mean, it's, it's so large that um, I just, I mean, from a practical reality standpoint, I, I, I'm just a little uh, dubious. I mean, you can get up on your, on a, on a, and there are folks who get up on soapboxes and say, you know, we, we really need the, uh, you know, the, uh, the carbon tax, which actually I would argue is, is more efficient than the cap and trade model. But, um, but they get shouted down. And it's just very difficult. And again, the world changes. I mean, the United States could, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, in the world views, could shift this way. We could look more like Japan. In which case, the arguments would become, I mean, the kind of perception, the, the in, instinctive response of where we should, what policy should we should take would, would mirror more like Japan or the European Union's. I mean, and the and the whole issue of uh, the carbon tax may be less, you know, explosive. So, I don't know. Um, yep. you, you mentioned the United States shifting, and I guess that's kind of what I wanted to ask about. Because, I, you know, I can see how countries would orient towards one sort of um, uh, policy agenda. Mm -hmm. But how do you think, um, or, or what do you think that, As I think was mentioned before, I think uh, certain companies are taking larger leaps than others. British Petroleum is one of them that uh, has heavily invested in solar, for instance, and heavily marketed solar. Um, I think they are the uh, the third third largest solar producer now. I can't remember exactly the the ranking, um, but uh, whether or not that, I mean, from the perspective of uh, whether or not that's going to I don't know, change the trajectory, is that what you're getting at? Of yeah. I mean, you know, do you think it would shift like, the, a country like the United States towards a more like, oh, you, focus? Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, the, the question you're asking is, is, do companies lead consumers or do consumers lead companies? And uh, I, would, I, would, I would tend to believe that consumers lead companies. Um, now, government policies can shape the company's decisions, of course, uh, but, uh, but by and large, I think consumers will lead companies. Any more questions? Great, thank you for joining me and thank you, Phyllis, for uh, oh. thank you.